required to read. This meeting is being held pursuant to and in compliance with ordinance number 20-A16, an ordinance to ensure the continuity of government during the COVID-19 disaster. Opportunities for the public to access and participate in the electronic meeting will be posted on the Albemarle County uh, calendar when available, and it was obviously. Okay, um, I don't see LJ at this point either, so I'm concerned about the, is anybody willing to take the brief minutes for this meeting? I'd appreciate it if- I can do it, I'll, I'll, I'll do it, Dick. Stephanie will? Yeah. Thank you very much, Stephanie. I appreciate that. Okay, I can wait to call on a quorum. Welcome to the uh, Pantops Community Advisory Committee. I want to thank Cameron Langill for all the help that he provides behind the scenes to my efforts and then on that behalf to all of your efforts as well. So Cameron, thank you very much. You're welcome. Brian Mason, I welcome you as a new member and I hope you enjoy meeting with us. We enjoy having you with us as well. Thank you. You have a quorum now, Dick. Okay, Rob Neal, thanks. Rob, we make the quorum when you showed up. Thank you. <laughs> the other newest member we have is Anthony Arsali. He currently uh, has suggested uh, his name, I presume he's been approved, Steve? Yes, okay, good. So we have a full complement now of 15 members. All right, uh, let's move on. I'd ask for an adoption of the draft minutes, which were emailed out to you. They're so moved. Second. Second. Cal, and who seconded? I did. And someone okay. else did. I third I thirded it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay. At this point, I'm going to turn the meeting over to B. Kirtley, our obviously our supervisor for the Pantops area. And B has put together the bulk of the, of the meeting for us. So B, it's all yours. You're, you're muted, you're muted, B. B you gotta there you go. I, I just got off another budget meeting that was from three to five-ish. And so anyway, that's okay because Trevor was there also. Cameron, were you there? I wasn't there. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, Lori was there, Lori Al's house. So um, today we're also having a town meeting uh, so that we can find, you all can learn about the budget. Other people hopefully are, will be joining us uh, or listening. They can ask questions. And then um, we will either answer them or uh, we'll write down the questions, we'll post the questions, and then we'll write answers to the questions. So um, the ones that are appropriate. <laughs> so um, we will be doing that. So that way the public as well as our CAC can, um, can talk about and give us what they think regarding the budget. So with that, I think Lori, you're going to do the presentation on the budget. No, Serena is going to do the presentation and kind of guide the meeting. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, thank you. I'm Serena Gria. I'm the public engagement specialist here with the county. And I have a uh, video that will show um, that has been done by the county executive. And, uh, and then we will take questions uh, following that presentation. So oh, and just, just to let you know, I'm sorry, but I just texted Anthony Arasali and he is currently dealing with a family emergency. So that's why he's not here. Go on. Thank you, Serena. 
Sure thing. Um, so I'm going to share this video and then following this, we will have a question and answer period. And let's see how it goes. Hello and welcome to this presentation of the fiscal year 2022 recommended budget. I'm Jeff Richardson, Albemarle County Executive, and I'll be walking you through our recommended budget today. This year's budget theme pulls forward the budget theme from fiscal year 2021, which was respond, recover, recalibrate. The fiscal year 21 budget was a budget in flux. We just didn't know a lot about what last April and May was about, and as well as the next 15 months. So therefore, we had to take a very cautious approach to build our budget using the best information that we had. We've added to that theme for fiscal year 22, the word resilient, because this recommended budget is designed to make strategic investments to transform our organization and our community, to make structural changes and alignments that ensure that we're focusing our resources in the right places. As always, our revenue recommendations are guided by our strategic plan, the initiatives which are shown here. The bottom bar that underpins the work of the strategic plan, quality government operations, that fuels our organizational capacity to advance the strategic priorities by investing in a quality workforce and managing our, our financial foundation in a way that sets us up for future success. Along with that, in 2020, we expanded the organization's core values. It now includes community. That means we expect diversity, equity, and inclusion to be integrated into how we live our mission. Our work ahead is to realize this value and develop tools and the training to empower our staff to integrate equity into all the work we do. I believe that thread begins to run through this budget. I believe this past year has demonstrated maybe more than any other year, the critical role that broadband plays in our lives. It's almost like electricity and water. Earlier this year, the Board of Supervisors approved establishing a broadband affordability and access program using strategic reserve funding. For this coming year, we will, we will continue to support that with additional staffing and ongoing money so that we can address our community needs. In addition, we will also uh, work with our housing policy with investment because our housing policy continues to work toward final editing. We want to put one-time one money, $600,000, into the Affordable Housing Fund to support the housing needs of our community. $1.7 million of our fund has already been previously committed to the Habitat for Humanity Southwood project. Also, there is $1.94 million that remains in the fund for other opportunities that will be identified later. Our board recently adopted a climate action plan. This coming recommended budget identifies one-time funding for project implementation. Also, the upcoming budget uh, invest in transit. Our budget will support the regional transit vision work that will set a roadmap for the transit future. Our community continues to grow and to keep up with these mandates and community priorities, it requires us to invest in our built environment. We've done that in fiscal year 21. We intend to do that going into fiscal year 22. We have been able to, in our capital budget, strategic investments to keep moving forward to ensure that we have the capacity and the equipment to maintain the community's quality of life. Based on the recommendations of our CIP advisory committee, this budget supports the construction of our courts project. We've also set aside funding for transportation leveraging, economic development, public-private partnerships. We will continue to invest in our schools. It's planned expansions at Crozet Mountain View Elementary. Both of these will address system capacity constraints. We'll also continue to invest in our parks and trails, notably the opening of Biscuit Run Park. This budget also continues to invest in the Registrar's Office, early voting for primary and election support. We experienced high volumes of customers over this past year, and this probably will continue. In addition, our comprehensive plan, which is the guiding document for one of our busiest policy areas, land use, 
Also, the state budget is currently supporting the full cost of two family preservation positions within social services at no cost in our FY22 budget. This budget also supports the needs of our regional partners, our nonprofits, the arts and cultural institutions, all of which meet so many of the human service needs in our community. And it also invests in our public safety function. North Garden Volunteer Fire Department is requesting career staff to support weekday daytime coverage. I, I, they are facing similar challenges that we faced a year ago in the Crozet community. This request would take five positions to support, as well as one-time funding to purchase a new ambulance. This budget has also recommended the addition of one additional staff person in our fire rescue training division to address capacity challenges due to increased personnel over the past several years. Within our police department, there has been a shift in how the school division will su provide security, and this will create capacity for how our five officers spend their time. With a new investment by local government for the equivalent of about two and a half officers, we will be gaining 5,000 hours of experienced patrol time that will be invested uh, throughout Albemarle County. This will support our geo-policing work and better connect us with our community, and it will enhance our public safety profile. Last year, we originally had recommended implementation of $15 an hour across the board for full and part-time staff, as well as a 2% market adjustment for all county staff. All of this had to be deferred once the pandemic hit. I'm pleased that this year that we've been able to put this back into the FY22 recommended budget, but the implementation of $15 an hour, as well as the 2% market adjustment. In addition to that, I want to continue our multi-year investment with our systems alignment and process improvement work, both inside the organization, as well as with some of our external facing departments. We will begin to scope a new enterprise resource planning effort. This includes the replacement of the County View system, which is in our community development department. I'm excited about this because this will allow us to be uh, more responsive to our citizen needs over the course of time. We still find ourselves very much in the throes of the pandemic. We, we have approached the one year mark. Fiscal year 21 and fiscal year 22 are linked much more tightly than we may have seen in recent years. I'll take a few minutes walking through the fiscal drivers of the budget. We believe that during the course of this coming year, our economy will continue to stabilize. We are going to continue to know a lot more about the long-term impact of the pandemic on our economy, on customer service expectations of the public, and the way we work. The approach for physical year 22 is that it's a year of transition. We believe that the investments we make now will make us more strong and resilient in the future. We start our budgets every year by taking a hard look at our diagnostics. How are we doing? For the past several years, it's been good news pretty much across the board with uh, assessments, business activity, consumer spending, and building activity. This year, Assessments continue to grow on the residential side and residential building activity is strong. Commercial real estate assessments are down five and a half percent. There are other areas in the community that are really struggling. For an example, SNAP applications year over year are up 34%. You may know that this is a federal program for food assistance based on income eligibility. In addition, our tourism and hospitality industry due to travel and gathering restrictions have been deeply impacted. Year-over-year -year hotel room occupancy rates are down 35%. These businesses generate consumer activity and they also supply many local jobs. Finally, our financial management policies, our planning, our conservative and flexible approach over the last 15 months has continued to allow us to judiciously guard our triple AAA bond rating. We are financially very, very strong. Recommended F FY22 budget is balanced at just over $466 million. This is a 85.4 cent tax rate, and that's the same tax rate as this present year. We are not recommending a tax rate going into fiscal year 22. This chart provides an overview of where our revenues are coming in from. And this chart provides us uh, an overview of where our expenditures are going. 
This is a position change summary. I've mentioned the six firefighters and training position in ACFR. I've mentioned the additional investment in broadband, as well as the state supported family support positions at DSS. I will also point out the 19 frozen positions across county government. That's about 39,000 hours of time that is being held as we continue to monitor our economy, we continue to monitor our workloads, and this hopefully will better position us through fiscal year 22 to continue to make necessary adjustments. Here's the budget development timeline for this year, moving toward a final public hearing on April 28th, the adoption of the budget on May the 5th. All meeting information is posted on our website and all meetings will be held virtually and in compliance with local and state ordinances. And finally, here is contact information. If you have questions, if you have comments that you would like to share, as always, we would love to hear from you. And I really want to take a minute to thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for participating in county government. Okay, so with that, um, uh, Serena is going to take over. And uh, if anyone has questions or if we have questions that have come in from, um, uh, from other residents in our area or county residents, or are there any questions um, from our CAC members? I guess just raise your hand and they'll go through them. I'll add here that in the chat, I um, put in the website that has all the budget information. So the presentation that was on the video, you'll find that there. And we've also added a sub page that includes some of the more frequently asked questions. So um, if you don't have a question here today, uh, you can certainly send a, a question to that email and we will find a space to add that to the website because all the questions we've received so far have uh, been helpful, not just to that one meeting, but to the community in general. I have a question. Go ahead. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, what is the status, uh, and I may be behind the times here, but what is the status of the fire truck for the Pantops uh, fire station? Is that in the budget or has it already been approved and acquired or being on the books to be acquired? I guess I'm a little perplexed about the call uh, not nothing personal against North Garden, but um, I, I, I don't want to lose the Pantops priority for a fire truck uh, in all of this process. I can answer that. Oh, goody. <laughs> <laughs> so the personnel costs are different from the equipment costs. So uh, having um, North Garden asked a similar to Scottsville where they said, you know, we, we can't staff during the day any, any longer. And that's because uh, the volunteers, not only locally, but nationwide are going down. Uh, the millennials and Gen Xers don't really, they're not doing what our great grandfathers did and our grandfathers and fathers, et cetera, et cetera, did. So the volunteer um, aspect has gone down. So they are asking for uh, paid staff during the day, just like uh, Scottsville asked for, and frankly, um, also uh, East Rydana and also Stony Point. But that has nothing to do with equipment. We, uh, equipment is rotated uh, when, when there's enough uh, miles on it or use on it, then uh, there's a schedule, kind of like repaving your roads, there's a schedule for that. Same thing with equipment and the trucks. Uh, the Cal Morris, Cal Morris. We've never had a truck out there. We've never right, had what? a truck. We have never had a truck at uh, Pantops. We have a rescue vehicle. Right, right. And uh, I can actually, I will, while someone else asked another question, I will quickly find out the answer because I will, <laughs> I will text uh, Chief Eggleston. Uh, but I, I 
thought there was were on schedule to get a truck there. Uh, remember, Pantops was only supposed to be, I mean, um, yeah, Pantops was only supposed to be just the uh, the ambulance and a, a small station. It's now gotten larger, or it's going to get larger because of the need. So, if someone That's asks asks a question, I will find Thank out you. for you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. That would be great, B. And I just would point out we had several bays built with that original Pantop station. It was supposed to start out with emergency vehicle uh, ambulance to start, but the uh, the long view was it was going to have a truck. So yeah, whatever you can do to support getting that uh, would be really wonderful. I think Trevor might question. have an answer. Oh yeah, that that truck has been ordered okay. and. Um, scheduled for delivery in the fall, probably October-ish will be in service. Thank you, Trevor. Yep. I what? just beat you on the text to Chief Eggleston. Oh, oh man. <laughs> what is staffing level at, at Station 16 now? Uh, uh, station, which in Station That's, 16 is? Pantops. Pantop. What staffing level? Ah, uh, I I don't know. I, I'm not sure if there's if it's 24 seven or not, but I think Trevor's going to find out for us. If, if it is 24 seven, that would be brand new news, frankly. Yes. And I, I'm not sure. Okay, Trevor's finding out. Several years ago, when we were working on developing that station, the issue of the fire truck was stated as that's not a financial issue because that will come via the U.S. government services in the uh, fire and land management department, whatever it is, so that the truck would be provided by the funds from the U.S. government would not be a state or a county expense. That was two or three years ago. Yeah. That I, that I, I don't want to answer because I don't know, Dick. I'm... But I think Trevor's finding that one out too. I didn't remember that part. I just remembered that the, the delay would be to make sure we had adequate staffing uh, for a, a truck. You had to have that too. And that, that's a county responsibility. Yes. And remember we had the big, uh, what happened at Stony Point because we lost daytime staff there. And that's when Chief Eggleston came out with dynamic staffing where they're putting three people uh, career staff people at uh, not only East Vivana, which they've done, uh, but also Stony Point, and they're going to be doing that in Earliesville also. And then that way you can pull a person and you'll still have two people there to be able to operate the, the ambulance. Uh, but that way, if there's a shortage somewhere else, um, he, he's really, I have to say, he's really good about focusing in on everything. Um, we are trying to get the volunteer stations, uh, however, to to let uh, Chief Eggleston know when they're not there. Like if they're not there in the evening, if they're not there on the weekends, they, they need to let Chief Eggleston know. And the only one that consistently does that is Earliesville. So that delays a response if, in fact, they don't let Chief Eggleston know that there's no one there or if they're responding from home. And I'm also gonna give you a little tidbit. You may not know about red hats and black hats, but if you're a black hat, you can go into a, a two people, you can go into a burning building, rescue people. If you're a red hat, so you don't have enough training, then you have to stay outside. So it's very important uh, that we have people, the, my whole point that I'm getting to is to have more people trained as much as we can. And of course, the career staff, they get that. The volunteers, that just means more and more hours, which is why you don't have as many volunteers because, you know, they're working. Um, so it's not an easy solution. I mean, we want to keep our volunteers. Um, we're trying to think of ways to incentivize them. Um, because if we don't, if we have to go without volunteers, it's going to cost us a lot more money, the county. So, Trevor, have any answers yet? I, I would call it a partial answer. I would suggest, based on the questioning, that you know it might be a good uh, future agenda item to have 
Chief Eggleston or one of his deputies come and give a, give a more thorough brief to uh, to the CAC on you know on Pantops and and what's happening there. But the program changes as well. I, just a just a suggestion. Uh, what Dan said is is that with the engine will be three full time uh, firefighters and that the, the the station will continue to be day uh, daytime operations only. Um, at least for, for now. This isn't uh, my, part of my portfolio, so I don't have a lot of a lot more depth on our um, on our system. But I'm sure Chief or, or one of his deputies would glad yeah, gladly attend a meeting uh, at a future date. Great, thank you, Trevor. Yes, sir. I've had uh, the chief on our proposed agenda for the last three meetings, and Cameron's been in contact with him, and every time. He has a meeting conflict, so he's not to <coughs> join us. But that is a priority topic for Pam. Well, we'll, yeah, Dick, we'll let him know when our meetings are and let him choose which month he can come or, or uh, maybe the deputy chief. Yeah, I'll circle back with Chief Eggleston, but one, okay. one of his deputies would be more than um, capable uh, to, to, I think, address all the questions and concerns y'all may have. I would think Thanks. so, yes. Thank you. Any other questions for B on the uh, proposed budget? B, I'd have the question of the implementation of the $15 an hour minimum. When is there a date on that? Is it phased in or is it all at once for all employees that are below the $15 an hour level? And Lori Al's house will respond to that. Okay, thank you, Lori. If I get it wrong, Trevor will correct me. My understanding <laughs> is it starts July 1, right? Yeah. July okay. 1? July, yeah. That, our fiscal years are July to June. So when we say fiscal year 22 budget, it's July. Um, so that's kind of what the planning says. So there's sometimes when we, you know, sometimes we can get something started a little ahead of time. But on that one, I think it's, it's going to start when the year starts. Okay. Thank you. Uh, no, I just wanted to, uh, just a question. For the fifteen dollars an hour, is that full-time employees, or I was just wondering about seasonal workers and lifeguards, et cetera? How does that impact that segment of our pop of, of your workforce? That's a great question, and I can answer that, um, Supervisor Lapisto Curley, if you'd like. Yeah, please. It's for uh, both full-time and uh, part-time staff. Uh, for for our seasonal um, summer program, we, we're still in a not sure what that's going to look like because of the pandemic and so what we have done is we've we've uh, set aside uh, funding in our budget that's one time that would allow us to implement summer swim and our typical programmings embedded in that uh, in the in, in those um, cost numbers assumes fifteen dollars an hour you know for that seasonal help and also, to put you know, to the, the impacts um, on local government staff, is, it's much less than on the school side. The schools have a lot more uh, employees that are kind of in that, um, that lower end of the, of the scale uh, of, of classification. So this is a bigger, um, uh, a bigger impact both in cost and numbers on, on the schools. Do we see um, raising people up to $15? What about those people that maybe were at $15 now? Does that impact that they get a re raise or anything or is that do you project that two percent there's a uh, that's a great question there is a um, um, through a certain level in the organization um, that you know it's it, it, it kind of cascades so so if you're at 15 now you'll get um, and this is really a, a HR you know methodology of how they do that but they, they'll move um, folks that are in that immediate area to avoid something called compression. So uh, to some degree, it's, it doesn't go all the way up into the organization, but certainly it, within that, um, that scale, it does. Mm -hmm. And just to, put it, oh, <laughs> just to put it in perspective, if you're making $15 an hour, that's $2,400 a month. Friends in Albemarle are minimum of maybe 1,200, go up to 1,900 uh, to rent a one, two or three bedroom home. Um, that's not a lot of money. We have a we we say that affordable housing 
developers have to set aside 15% for affordable housing, which is 80% of the AMI. In Abomarl, that's 93,000. So that would mean you'd have to make about $74,000 to be able to uh, uh, purchase or rent an affordable house. And um, at $15 an hour working full time, that's only 20,000 a year. So this is something we wanted to do last year and we did not because of the pandemic. Yep. Other questions? We've got our people here. I got my peeps here. <laughs> um, just to clarify, for the people that are already currently making around $15 an hour, well, I, I didn't quite understand exactly what was going to happen to those employees. That'd be a Lori or Trevor. Lori, do you want to try to explain it better than I did? I, there, there is a, a cascading of a pay scale. Yeah. So, so those those per persons that are in that in that range would see, you know, the budget also includes a two percent raise on average. So, if you're if you're at fifteen now, you would likely see a small bump, you know, ahead of that two percent. So it creates it creates a little bit of space. Yeah. The the key is, and I'll just add on. Uh, Trevor hit it correctly. Um, our human resources folks are, that are the experts on this study it very carefully at, at certain levels in the organization. And they, what you don't want is, you know, someone coming in that you just hire, making more than some of them might've been here 10 years, you know, in this same kind of general category. So they're really careful and, and they, they, kind of, they kind of bump it as, as Trevor said, up through the scale, not all the way to the top of the organization, but through a certain category where, where the HR specialists study it and say this is a very important area that we also have to move some folks up on the scale a little. Good. So the adjustment just isn't at, at the $15 where you come into the organization. It has to kind of um, cascade as Trevor said through several um, le levels. Hope that helps. Yeah. Other questions or areas of, of interest that might be budget related or county related? Remember the school board, they're gonna be getting the, uh, the people who work there will be getting the raises also, the increase. I guess, I, 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 this is not so much a question as a concern. I, I worry uh, about the lack of, of really committed affordable housing whether it's it's pan tops or around the area, I I I really feel like we need to have a, a stronger statement, whether it's in our budget or our mission statements or whatever, that the the housing costs in Albemarle County are about to approach Northern Virginia, and maybe they're at this, I, and I'm I'm worried because. We have so many people here who are in the service industry, whether it's in service to UVA or it's in service to some other entity, and they've got to be able to live and work and afford to live here and work. And that, that worries me that we don't seem to have a, a concrete committed philosophy to, to make that happen. And, um, I, I hope that we will somehow or another incorporate that in our visions going through. Well, we are currently, and thank you, Sarah. That was, that's very, that's a very good question. We are currently, the supervisors, we're looking at our affordable housing policy. So you can actually go online to abamoral.org. You can look at our housing policy. Uh, we haven't finalized it yet. Uh, but we are looking uh, and trying to encourage developers um, to have anywhere from 30, 40, 50, 60% of the um, area mean income, area median income, uh, 
to be able to have affordable housing. Right now, as I told you, it's 80%, which means you have to make about $74,000 a year. And our teachers don't make that. Our police officers don't make that. Our firefighters don't make that. So it's very important that um, we do have uh, some other affordable housing. Now, hang on because uh, I've spoken with developers. If you want affordable housing, you're going to probably have to go higher and Cameron can address this too. You're gonna to have to go higher and you're gonna to have to go uh, more uh, dense and I've got people in areas of Ravenna that are saying, go out into the rural area, start building out in the rural area. Well, in my opinion, if you start building out in the rural area, you lose what Albemarle has become, which is a wonderful place to live. You, you don't wanna become Northern Virginia and go out into the rural area. However, in the urban core, we're gonna to have to probably go higher and denser and provide transportation which, you know, we're doing that already. Um, but, but that's what's going to happen. I mean, unless someone has a, uh, another solution, um, it's not easy. Cameron, you want to weigh in on that? Uh, you're exactly right. Uh, I mean, <laughs> it's the whole concept, you know, behind this distinction that we have with our comp plan areas between the development area and the rural area. Um, I mean, in the development areas, you do have to build things uh, at a higher density. And oftentimes that does mean buildings that are a little bit taller than, you know, two stories. You might see four or five story apartment buildings. But what that does do is ensure that that, you know, sprawl does not go outside of our development area and encroach into the rural areas, which that's been, you know, the whole goal behind the comprehensive plan since it was adopted back in 1980. Um, and so, I mean, it's something that we'll see, you know, as developers do continue to, to look to build here in the county. But yeah, that's, you're right. The, the other thing developers have said is if we could have a process whereby things go faster. So um, I was thinking about this last night. Uh, anyway, I was thinking about this last night and I thought, well, why can't we have maybe a, a, a set type of development that looks good, form base code and everything that looks good, but if you commit to higher or more density, higher density uh, and affordability, why can't this kind of like get a um, kind of like an easy pass through the uh, <laughs> through the building permit prob uh, concern, you know, through the county? Wouldn't that, I don't know, it's probably not feasible, but I come up with these ideas in the middle of the night. So what can I say? <laughs> I see Brian Mason, you have your hands up. I just had a question about, so when we talk about affordable housing, what does that mean in the sense of, is it a, a voucher system or how is that managed or controlled about who gets to live in that housing? Is it a, like I said, a voucher system or anything like that? And then if we are looking at going out to, because we can't build as much in the inner city, does that mean, what, what does that look for as far as transportation if we start pushing our families and stuff for affordable housing out to the rural areas and things like that. So uh, just to get a couple of responses around those two areas. Well, I can tell you, we're not looking at the rural air, go pushing out into the rural areas at this point in time and whether or not that will ever happen, I don't know. Uh, but we're not looking at, I don't think in the for, affordable housing plan, I, I'm not sure we're looking at a voucher system. I will tell you we've had an affordable housing plan now for 10 years. Uh, remember the 15% of the, um, uh, has to be 80% 80, 80 AMI, which means you have to make $74,000 a year. We've had 44 home sales. <clears throat> That's not a very good record. So obviously that is way too much. So maybe one of the others can um, join in and address your question. Brian, I was thank you. Thinking with okay. housing prices going up for materials and everything else and shortage of housing and stuff yeah. like that. How do you get a builder to say build it for less than what they can make money on with that? How does yeah. just... so can I can I wait? This is Rob Neal. I'm I'm in finance and accounting for real estate developers. 
Um, and everything that everybody has said is right on. Now, I'm not the person swinging the hammer or doing the actual land purchasing, but I run the numbers. And I mean, it's, you know, it, it's in order, in order to develop afford affordably, and I agree the AMI, you know, because our AMI is so high, that afford that 80%, I mean, that's, you know, it, it doesn't really um, do the purpose where it might in another community. You know, we say we want affordable housing, absolutely. But then we say we want view sheds. Well, if you want view sheds, then you can't go, in order to have affordable housing, you have to give up view sheds and go further up. Or you have to give up some of the defined parameters of a development area and have some urban sprawl into the counties. Now, I live here because I love my beautiful view shed of my house and I love to leave my house and in two miles, I'm in the country. But you know, is that more important to me than my neighbors and fellow citizens having affordable houses? You have to make a decision. And the only, because in this county, 5% of the land mass is in the development area. Supply and demand, you know, a first grader can understand if you're only allowed to build on 5% of the land mass and you're not allowed to go higher than four stories, it's going to be pretty darn expensive. So, you know, what's the most important thing to this community? Do we want affordable housing or do we want pretty views or do we want as many, you know, rural areas close to the urban ring as possible? We just have to make that choice as a community. And there's not a wrong choice or a right choice, but you have to make the choice. Um, you brought, uh, Mr. Mason, you brought up a great informed, you know, question about building materials. Yeah, lumber is up like 100% in the last year. So that puts a, puts a further you know, stress on when you, when you define that development area with only 5% of the county and height, you know, we can't go, we're not allowed to go 80 stories up, we're allowed to go four or five stories up. You put that all together with the building material and the builders you know, cannot build anything and pay their, their employees reasonable salaries. So, we as a community must make a choice. It's not right, not wrong, it's somewhere in between. But if we're not gonna let people build, you know, one mile out from the urban ring, then houses are gonna be expensive. And that's just how it is. Yeah, I've spoken with a developer and I, I don't know if it's beyond four stories. Uh, it's either beyond four stories or six stories. It's very cost effective for them, you know, if they can go higher. Correct. And, and the, the timing also, so the timing, like the developments I've been a part of, it'll take two to three years. And we're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of carrying costs and attorney's fees and engineers that the longer the process takes, the more yeah. the development costs. And therefore that gets, you know, put another 10,000 on the plot of land that you're going to build a house on or another $45 a month for the first year rent for the apartment. So the, the, the timing, you, you, you carry it, you buy a piece of land and you carry it for two years, every extra six months, the, the legal fees and the carrying cost just, you know, expounds on the, the cost of what that end structure is going to be. So that, I'll try to be quiet now, but I thought I could give a little, you know, insider information that, you know, it's, we just have to make choices as a community and what do we value the most? You know, do you, do you value your retirement or going on vacation this year? What's most important to you? You know, when you vote, do you value your, your trees and your views or do you value your neighbors being able to live here? We all have to make a choice. Thank you, Ron. Appreciate your input. We had a, a great deal of information put into our program tonight. I'm sure that there are questions that may come up as we're able to look at the uh, details of the numbers and how it's presented. It was done very, very well, and I certainly appreciate it, but it was a whole lot of information all at once. <laughs> you guys have worked pretty hard putting that together. I will say the staff has done an amazing job. I, I just, I cannot be more complimentary 
of our county staff. They, they do they do a great job. And we still have our AAA, AAA bond rating. So that's really, that's really important too. Well done. Any further questions or issues? If not, we'll move on to uh, Cameron's presentation, which is going to be a, an update on the development projects that are currently ongoing here in Anton. Cameron? Thanks, Dick. Um, so, oh, oh, oh. Lori wanted to say something. I want to say so long. I think you're done with the budget part, so I'll, I'll head home. But so great <laughs> to see everyone. Such wonderful questions and good energy. And I just really appreciate the invite to be here tonight. So thank you, Lori, here. and thank Bye, you, Serena. Lori. Thank you, Bye. everybody. OK, thank you, Serena. All right, everybody. Um, Dick, thanks for letting me have the opportunity to give an update quickly about some of the development projects here in Pantops. Um, not a whole lot has changed since January. So I will say um, the Presidio Apartments site, which is just south of the hospital, it's still under construction. Um, they're still in the, the process of doing some of their grading and site stabilization. Uh, I don't even think they've, you know, begun to put like footers in for the buildings yet, but they are making progress. Um, it'll probably be a while for that project to actually get built. But um, if you drive by there, that's what that project is. Uh, just as a reminder, it's gonna be 250 uh, multifamily apartment units. Um, if you want the information, you can send me an email. I do have a breakdown on the amount of bedrooms. I think most of them are one bedrooms, um, but there are some two and three bedroom apartments in there. Um, of course, I'm sure everyone sees it probably daily, but uh, the Wawa and the hotel at the Pantops Corner development, that's still under construction as well. Uh, you know, the Wawa has gone up pretty quickly. That was the last thing that they were tackling there, but the building uh, looks like they've got pretty much all the frame up. So they're just working on the interiors. Um, there's still some, you know, pavement they need to put down for the parking lot for the Wawa, but the through street, you know, that is constructed. So there's a little bit of work left there, but that site will be operational probably, I would say in the next, I don't know, four to six months. Um, if everyone recalls at our January meeting, we had a community meeting for a uh, proposed rezoning, uh, the Overlook Hotel, which is right up here at the Rivanna Ridge Shopping Center, which is where the Giant is located. Staff has done one review on that application and we sent comments to the applicant with some suggested revisions that we had they have not resubmitted yet, but they have requested a deferral so that they can make those revisions and submit it for another review with staff. So there's no public hearings scheduled yet with the planning commission or board for that project. It'll probably be not a few months at least before that would even come up. So I'll be glad to keep everyone updated on the status of that project uh, once they do resubmit and we have some more information. The last project I wanted to talk about was, um, you all will probably remember this, this is gonna go back a couple of years now, but there was another apartment project proposed along South Pantops Drive, which was uh, next to the Overlook condominiums. That project was called the Vistas at South Pantops. Um, I, I was made aware that recently there was a, a small uh, backhoe that was actually parked onto that property I've gotten some emails from members of the public asking what the status is. And the, the site plan for that project still is active and under review, um, but there has not been any approvals yet. They haven't even gotten a grading uh, approval for that site. So there's not gonna be any work occurring there at, at least for a, a short while until they get those approvals. Um, the last thing I had heard was that the developer was actually uh, this was between them and adjacent property owner, they needed some easements and that was potentially holding this project up, which is why we haven't had much news about it in a long time. But I did verify that technically, um, based on the uh, county code and state code, it is still under review. Um, but if they don't resubmit plans to us, I believe it's by June 15th, then that application will be withdrawn under the state code rules for the timing that you have to resubmit plans. 
And if that were to happen, then they would have to basically start over if they wanted to pursue the project. So um, development on that site is not imminent. And I don't know if and when the applicant is planning to resubmit, but um, yeah. So I think that is, that's, that's all the projects I had on my list. I don't know if anyone has questions about any projects or anything you've heard about that may be coming. Uh, let's see, Sarah, I see you had your hand raised. Well, I'll, I've, I've spoken a lot. I'll defer to Ron and then I'll go after him. Okay. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, just a couple of questions on the Overlook. Um, what is the driving requirement for the right in, right out only for that vehicle entrance? Yeah, there's a threshold where VDOT won't um, allow a full access entrance. I don't know what the exact traffic figure count is, but the main reason why VDOT wants to see a right in, right out only on that site is because um, we have these smart scale applications that are going to uh, build like a median along the, the suicide lane, as we all call it. Mm -hmm. Um, the Pantos master plan actually recommends having a median in that lane all the way from Rolkin Road down to Route 20. And, and the uh, smart scale project that we actually received funding for in this last round, it's going to build that median up to uh, town and country lane, I believe. But in anticipation of knowing that one day it will be fully extended, VDOT didn't want to grant a permit there to allow left turns out to head onto 250 toward Freebridge. So um, does that mean that um, going westbound on 250 and turning left into uh, to Hanson Road, which is the entry to Carriage Hill and also the, one of the entries to the Giant, will that, is that likely to go away? No, so the, like at the intersection, um, Oh, I see you're talking you're the, the, at the non-signalized left turn into there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you can turn currently now left uh, into onto Hanson from 250 going westbound. Yeah. Yeah. So that segment of the median hasn't been funded or approved yet. I mean, it is in the master plan, but I would say that yes, it probably would go away. I mean, they would keep the uh, signalized intersection at Rolkin Road where you can make that left, but um, that that small driveway that's not signalized would probably just be a right in, right out only. Okay. Dara, go ahead. Oh, so what about the other lot there with the Wawa and the storage and the Holiday Inn Express that they've got a for sale sign up for Cameron? What, uh, what, what's about that? So there is, um, if you're looking at that site, it's at the front left. Mm -hmm. There's a little area where the original plan was to build a small two-story retail building. So it would be something that you would see, you know, maybe a couple tenants, some leasing space in there, you know, like a restaurant and some other retail shop. Um, that went away when that property owner was contacted about building a self-storage facility there. So the approved plans don't actually have a building on that corner. I suspect that he has the for sale sign up because, you know, you'd like to sell that space off, but there are no plans um, for any sort of structures on that small corner of the property. They would have to go through a site plan process with us if they did want to end up building something more than the self-storage, the Wawa, and the hotel. The uh, Albemarle County uh, thing, I don't know if it was planning commission or zoning, someone went back uh, to the Holiday Inn Express and they had to modify the facade or uh, the entrance way to it. Could you tell us what in, in regular English, Cameron, what that meant that the Holiday Inn Express had to change? Sarah, I'll just be honest with you. That's the first I've heard about that. Oh. <laughs> um, I can look into that. Um, I didn't know that they had you know, if any staff had gone out there about any issues. Well, yeah, it, it, it appeared on on one of the sites that they, something had to go back and be remodified on the Holiday Inn Express. Okay. And this was at an ARB meeting. Okay. Yeah, okay. Either earlier this month or last month. So you might want to reach out to um, yeah. Margaret. Okay. Uh, sorry for interrupting, but- No, no yeah. please, you needed the information. And, yeah. And once again, nobody has applied to the county or to your staff for a, uh, 
a permit or a site approval or whatever for the DMV location that the people keep saying is available for restaurant or whatever? Yes, we have not received any applications for that site. Um, the property owner met with us probably four or five months ago to get an idea about what the Pantops master plan recommended if he were to pursue a rezoning or a special mm -hmm. use permit. Um, but he did not have any, you know, prospective people lined up that wanted to, to have that site at that time, or at least from what he told us. Well, so okay. um, I know that that for sale sign is still up there, but if, if, if they do want to rezone or go through that special use permit process, you all will be made aware. We'll have a community meeting and everything. So I will keep you updated. Thank you, Cameron. Cameron and the Wawa site, is the road at the north side of it built or planned to be built or is it just a single entrance off of 250 entrance and exit? So the, it goes all the way through the site from 250 up to 20 Stony Point Road. Um, so it, it's, it's built right now. I don't think that they've been issued their final driveway permits by VDOT. So that's why you don't see, you know, I mean, they've still got cars up there every day that are doing construction sort of blocking that travel way. But um, it is built for the full length uh, from 250 up to 20. B, I see you have a question. Yes. Um, remember the, we gave uh, our opinion on the site that was going to be built across, um, it was supposed to be a small hotel across from State Farm on that corner. Yes. Way up. Hampton Inn. Yes. Yeah, what, yeah. What's happening with that? Yes, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. That one slipped my mind. That site is, uh, it does have a site plan under review. Um, they have not submitted to, we've done one review on that application and issued comments to the developer, but they have not resubmitted in probably six or seven months, I would say. I think it was sometime around August or September where we sent those comments out. Um, I can check and see if there's any, any updates on that, but uh, as far as I know, they're still trying to, to get it approved. Where is the site? So this was the uh, hotel that it's along uh, State Farm Boulevard. Um, there's like, you know, the, the probably like six or seven vacant parcels right there on the mm -hmm. west side of State Farm. Yeah. And the northernmost two of those, um, we're going to have a, a hotel built. I believe it was a Hampton Inn. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. beside the Virginia High School League office or whatever that's called. Yeah. Right. That's right. Yeah, I'm playing inside. Okay. Cameron, I have one question. What about the um, where the old Malloy Ford building is? There was something I saw about some other used car dealer going in there potentially, or what's happening yes. with that site? So there was like a vinyl sign that was hung on the building at some point where I thought that they were, you know, preparing to actually have a new car dealer move in there. Um, as far as I know, nothing has happened. I've driven by there at night a few times and I can see, you know, it looks like, uh, I don't know, the property owners are still going into that building and doing stuff in there. And I, every now and then you'll see some new vehicles that are just like parked out front, which I guess they might use that as a staging ground to drop some vehicles before they move them up to their new site on 29. But we haven't received any applications to like redevelop the site. Um, and I don't think we've issued any zoning clearances for a different automobile dealer to move in there and occupy it. So I, I, there is um, a for sale sign or like a for lease sign at on town and country right there at the corner of 250. So they might just be shopping it, try and figure out what they want to do with the site moving forward. Thanks, Cameron. Any other questions? I, yeah, Ron. I, I just have a, a affordable housing, uh, just a general uh, question. Uh, has this commission ever had somebody come in and, and speak to them? Uh, recently in the recent years about affordable housing? Or, or is there somebody we might have bring in to speak about it or? Yeah, so um, we do have a, a housing planner in the community development department. Her name is Stacy Pethia. I believe she might've come out to the CAC 
a while. It was would have been 2019, even potentially late 2018. Um, but she is our expert on affordable housing, and she's worked, you know, on the policy and, and looking at ways to, you know, implement new methods to actually acquire affordable housing with these projects that we see. And yeah, I, yeah, she would be glad to come out to one of our future meetings and discuss that more in depth. I can do that and reach out to her uh, if that's something the CAC would like to hear. And remember, we're all talking about affordable housing, not only for purchasing, but also for renting. So. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll move into old business. Any old business to bring up? Any new business to bring up? The last thing I'll mention is that the county has just put out the uh, next 10 months worth of scheduled meetings for us. They're all on the uh, uh, same uh, time frame that we're on now. They're all on a six, they say six o'clock. We used to be 615, so I think we need to clear up 615 versus six. Yeah, uh, which, which one are we? Because I, I've seen both times. It so, is 615. Uh, That's yeah. what I thought. Okay. Like on Zoom, it won't let me put quarter of the hour. So I have to put six o'clock on your Zoom invite, but on the calendar, I have it listed as 615. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. So our next meeting then is scheduled as April 26th. Probably still a Zoom meeting, which seems to work well. You all look good on Zoom. <laughs> uh, and I, yes, I have a board update. I, I wanted you to know, and please tell me if you do not agree, but I'm hoping uh, that the state will let us continue uh, Zoom meetings. I think I brought this up before, but br uh, um, continue Zoom meetings, uh, at least for the CACs. We seem to have more participation uh, and maybe every once in a while, you know, meet in person, but we seem to have more participation. People are really getting used to this format and it saves on staff time. We can actually get more people here. And um, so I'm just throwing that out to let you know that that's something I'm interested in pursuing. Great. Works for me. Good. I just like to see an occasional in person, maybe once a year. Yes. Maybe we can do a a little holiday party or something. <laughs> uh, and the other thing I wanted to let you know is a CenturyLink um, with the new American Rescue Plan that were the monies we're getting and also from the state and from the county. Uh, we are, they're putting in 100 miles of fiber and there should be a map coming out. Uh, I, I received it tonight. I can't share it because, you know, I can't share it, but should be coming out tomorrow. And there's a lot going in the Stony Point area along 20. And there's a lot going up uh, 22 also near um, all the way up to Cobham area. So um, that is really, really a good sign that we're, we're getting that. Broadband is actually one of our priorities as supervisors we consider it a health and safety issue. It's no longer, um, you know, just playing video games. We do consider it a health and safety issue. We think it will be here for the rest of our lifetime because more and more people will be doing telemedicine uh, for those people who cannot get out of their homes, cannot travel, and yet they need to see the doctor or something is going wrong. So. Um, we consider that a priority. We're putting money behind it. The federal government is putting money behind it, as is the state. So also, um, look for that map tomorrow if you, I think, but probably everybody here has fiber internet, good at internet access. Mm -hmm. Brian, yes? Uh, I, I, I do, but there's another service provider, I think it's called Ting. I, I, I may get that wrong, but I know in our area, in Pantops, so where I live at Pavilion at Pantop, we don't have it, but I think uh, uh, one of the other neighborhoods behind us has it, 
what determines, I think it's more than just the provider. I think there's some other things that prevent some of the service providers from coming in, but it would open up competition and my understanding their services pretty up there with a lot of other uh, service providers. Do you know if there's anything preventing from a county standpoint from them coming in or is it, or with the new infrastructure that you all are trying to build with that? allow them to come in. Right, right. Um, is that uh, with a satellite? I don't think it's a satellite. Um, I think it's fiber. Uh, optic. It's, okay, um, okay. It's um, fiber optic. And I okay. had, it, I, I have investigated in the past. It's been a while, so I can't really say the up to date, but I did call them a couple of years ago thinking about for um, out Stony Point Road as far right. as trying to get it out there. And they said it wasn't in their strategic plan as far as their locations. But they met the, since the pandemic, they, their strategic plan as far as their outreach and where they're going to go may, ha, may have changed. So it might be worth pursuing to ask them mm -hmm. what their plans are and if they're getting some of the, um, um, some of the American Rescue Plan money to, okay. improve the, to, to expand their services as well. B, uh, I, they, we, uh, just to jump in real quick to answer Stephanie's question. They had Ting has expanded past Riverside Village. Uh, they installed all their fiber cable when the properties were under construction, and they have expanded into Cascadia. Uh, at the time, uh, the only two uh, broadband styles were uh, Xfinity with Comcast and Ting and CenturyLink on a limited basis. Um, so CenturyLink has been expanding their broadband uh, optical service uh, along, but they've been doing it quietly. So now I think they're going more public with it, yes. especially with 5G coming out there. But uh, how far past Cascadia uh, Ting has gone, I don't know. Right now they seem to be courting, Brian, to your question, they seem to be courting new construction uh, rather than existing. Yeah, to take down South Pantops and they ran through, our, through Carriage Hill to get to the new church. Right. And I will say this uh, CenturyLink, they will be going up 20 all the way to Barbersville. And uh, there is also something else out there called Starlink. And that is a, um, a disc that, you know, for someone that's way out there, uh, that is a disc, uh, reasonable and good service. Um, but we are trying to get broadband out to everybody. It's very frustrating because it's a private, all these companies are private entities. We can help them and give them money, but they're private entities and they're controlled also by the state and federal government. Uh, and I'll give you an example. CenturyLink was gonna do the Cobham area, uh, the St. John Road. And then all of a sudden uh, they were taken out because another company, uh, Rappahannock was doing it with CBEC. So, that kind of fell apart the last few months. Um, we thought that was going to happen and it didn't happen. So it's very frustrating to deal with these companies, but I think they now know everyone's putting enough pressure on them that we are getting there. Uh, it will still be, you know, a year, year and a half, but we're getting there. Ting was just installed at Highland Ridge within the last year. And uh, before they came here, they, had to have a commitment from a certain number of neighbors in the community before it made sense financially for them to come here. So mm -hmm. the, uh, the HOA signed an agreement, a bulk agreement with Ting, and they actually now bill the HOA on a monthly basis. And the HOA bills the individual homeowners that are using Ting. And it's a, it's a great service. It did take a while and it's all underground fiber optic cable. So there's a lot of money that uh, is involved in installing it. But thank you, Brian, for bringing that up. Any other discussion? I, B, I want to remind you, maybe you've caught up on it or not, but there's three members whose terms expire June 30th. They're all in their third term. So it's Rob Neal, Olivia Branch, and Louis Lopez all have third year coming up on June 30th. Are they allowed to be re-nominated? Or is it term I, limit? Is there a three term limit, Cal? 
I thought I, that I honestly do not know. I do not know. Well, we'll find out. Okay. Anything else? Well, thank you all tonight. B, it was a good program. We appreciate uh, you bringing oh, in county resources. Uh, they're certainly well prepared as usual. And Cameron, we appreciate your participation and update on the dashboard development as well. So. Welcome. It's always a it's always a pleasure to come to this meeting every month. Yes. <laughs> well, we hope it keeps that way. And Stephanie, and I want to know much. whether or not if you have a motion, it will Cal or his cat be making that motion or second? The, the cat. Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to know. <laughs> Stephanie needs to know for her minutes. <laughs> I'm sorry, but <laughs> we, we all I've enjoyed understand. seeing the cat participate as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Stephanie, for volunteering. With yeah. the no problem. I might need some help with filling in a couple of things, but I'll do draft minutes and send them to you, Dick, and then you can maybe, and Cameron, and maybe you can. Um, add in some things if I miss something. Yeah, Stephanie, uh, just so everyone else knows this as well, I apologize, I don't think I've mentioned this, but you know, since we've gone virtual, um, all of these meetings are being recorded and it's usually about two to three days after the meeting ends. We update the county calendar, like the page for this specific meeting. If you click it, you can actually go back and watch the recording. We'll have it posted there as a video. So I mean, if, you, if you ever miss a meeting and just want to get a recap about what we talked about, that will be available. You can email me if you need help finding the link and I can get it to you. But uh, for these instances where we do have to you know, take minutes, that video recording can help as well just to transcribe what we talked about. Great. So it's all video then, the recording. So yep. Nothing is transcribed then. No. Oh, good. Well. So you, you entertain a motion to adjourn? Yes, we're adjourned. Okay. Very good. Okay. Bye all. See you all next month. <laughs>